Alright, welcome to the third unit of AP Chemistry. This unit's all about thermochemistry and thermodynamics. This unit is chock full of a lot of very interesting labs. It's also full of a lot of vocabulary, as you've no doubt noticed from uh, the first page of your packets. This unit is rather large. It will take us all the way up until the, uh, just up until Thanksgiving break. So with that in mind, let's just delve right in. Let's move right on to some vocabulary that you're going to need to know for this unit in order for it to make any sense whatsoever. Thermochemistry deals a lot with energy. So we're going to start with, well, what on earth are you talking about when you're talking about chemistry, when you're talking about energy? Well, energy is simply the ability to do, wor do work or produce heat. And we symbolize it with the letter E. Now that energy can take one of two forms. It can either be potential energy or it can be kinetic energy. In general, potential energy is the energy stored in an object relative to another object. And in large-scaled objects such as uh, your cell phone, you, another person, uh, it can be calculated by taking gravity into effect. However, on the nanoscopic scale, on the scale we use in chemistry, gravity is negligible. So therefore, potential energy in this case is driven in chemistry by the attraction or electrical charges on certain objects. This interaction between particles based on their charges is called electrostatic energy, and it's a type of potential energy that we'll be talking about in chemistry. The proportion of these two charges we can denote as E electric, E subelectric, or just Eel. And it's proportional to the electrical charges of two objects and inversely proportional to the distance between them. What does that all mean? It simply means that when it is positive, two objects are going to be are going to repel one another, and when it's negative, two objects are going to attract one another. Like so. Since both of these are positive, <coughs> even if both of them were negative, they're going to repel one another. So our electrostatic potential would be positive because they are going to repel one another and that can be harnessed and used to do work. Since these are negative, they're going to come together and store up the ability to move apart. So it's going to be building up potential energy. In chemistry, potential energy is not only driven by charges, but it can also be measured in the energy stored inside of a bond, which is going to be the main component of what we talk about in this unit. So typically when we talk about potential energy in chemistry, we're either talking about the attraction between particles or we're talking about the energy stored within a particular bond. The opposite of stored energy would be the energy that's being used. We call this kinetic energy, and it's known as energy of motion, because something's moving. Usually, when we're talking about things that are moving, we're talking about particles. And we measure this energy in chemistry on the Kelvin scale. The reason for this is because the Kelvin scale is based on the kinetic energy of gases, and if something has a has is at zero degrees Kelvin, we call that absolute zero. It means it has no kinetic energy. Um, that's the basis for the Kelvin scale. Now, if you took all of the kinetic energy and added up all the potential energy in an object, you would have what's known as the internal energy of the system, or the overall energy of the system. And this is a constant, because p uh, p kinetic energy can be converted into potential energy. And potential energy, once being used up, while it's being used, is converted into kinetic energy. And therefore, energy can be neither created nor destroyed. This is called the law of conservation of energy. Also known as the first law of thermodynamics. So look at that, we've already covered one law in thermodynamics. 
So again, as, as kinetic energy is stored, it becomes potential energy. As potential energy is used up, it becomes kinetic energy. This is the first law of thermodynamics, also known as the law of conservation of energy. Heat, or what you feel is heat, isn't necessarily a transfer, is not a measure of energy. It simply reflects the motion of the particles in something. And heat always flows from warmer objects to cooler ones. And this is a transfer because the temperatures differ and it moves down what's called a concentration gradient. An area where there's a lot more movement is going to is a greater concentration than an area where there's less movement. So it's going to space itself out as much as possible. So again, heat is simply the transfer of energy in a process. And we symbolize it by the lowercase q. Why? I don't know. But it's a Q. So while we're talking about heat, let's talk about something that's related to heat, enthalpy, or enthalpy. Enthalpy is a measurement of the total energy of a system. And since heat is a reflection of the amount of energy within a system, these two are related. And the scientist that was studying enthalpy knew that, and that's why we symbolize enthalpy with a capital H. At constant pressure, it's a heat content, how much heat is present within this particular substance. And depending on what's happening within a system will depend on what that value is, because it's going to change as something undergoes some sort of either chemical or physical change. If it undergoes a chemical change, you can have an enthalpy of reaction, which would be the change in heat, change in enthalpy, for a particular reaction. So the heat absorbed by a system would be its change in, in or would be its enthalpy of reaction, the heat gained by a system be its enthalpy of reaction if it's undergoing a chemical change. If it undergoes a phase change, such as if it melted or vaporized, that's simply the change in heat or the change in energy as it undergoes those, as it becomes solid or as it becomes a liquid. Sorry, as it becomes a liquid or as it becomes a gas. And since the basis for most chemistry, for most of our chemical reactions, is the mole, it only makes sense that we use it here. So the heat absorbed by one mole of a substance undergoing either one of these phase changes at either the melting point or the boiling point. Now heat of combustion and formation, those two also deal with a chemical reaction, but very specific chemical reaction. Enthalpy of of combustion would be the heat absorbed or released when a substance is burned. So whenever it reacts usually with oxygen. The last enthalpy to talk about is the enthalpy of formation. And this is when something forms out of its, when one mole of a compound forms from the elements in their standard state. So oxygen when it's elemental oxygen, O2, or hydrogen when it's elemental hydrogen, H2. So the formation of water from oxygen and hydrogen would have an enthalpy of formation because you're taking elemental oxygen and elemental hydrogen and you're combining them together using an exothermic reaction. It might be endothermic. Don't quote me on it. Now up to now I've been throwing these two words around, the system and the surrounding, and you might have your head spinning a little bit trying to be like, what on earth is he talking about? And no, I'm not having matrix flashbacks or anything. It's simply the system is wherever we are, whatever we are doing our reaction in. It's the reaction itself. It's what we are physically observing. We're saying this is our system. And everything around it, from the beaker, to you holding it, to the rest of the universe, is the surroundings. So a system is simply whatever you are observing, or where the reaction that you're observing is taking place, and the surrounding is everything that is not involved in that very specific system. Now some more words that get thrown around a lot uh, in this unit are endothermic and exothermic. 
and an endothermic reaction, energy goes into the system. It's absorbing energy, or energy is a reactant, and it's going to be gained to produce your products. In an exothermic reaction, it's the opposite. Energy exits the system. Exothermic, it exits. Endothermic, it goes into. So energy exits the system in an exothermic reaction, meaning that energy is one of your products. Now another term you're going to come across in this unit is what we call state function or state func or state functions. State functions isn't a dinner that uh, Senator Forbes throws. Instead, it's actually the concept that it doesn't matter which pathway you take to get to somewhere, it's still going to have the same outcome. It doesn't matter how I get to California. It only matters that I was in Virginia, I'm now in California. So my location is a state function. It doesn't matter how I got to a certain place. It only matters that I did. In chemistry or in, in thermodynamics, when we say state function, it means that it doesn't matter how many steps you take to figure out uh, the energy in a reaction. Overall, it's going to have the same change in enthalpy. So here we have two pathways to make sodium chloride. In one pathway, we simply combine sodium gas and chlorine gas and ba-dam we got some sodium chloride. And overall, it has a change of, or change in energy of negative 411 kilojoules per mole. In the second pathway, we go through a whole bunch of half steps. It's assuming that we have solid sodium. And therefore, the steps are a little different, but in the end, we still undergo, we still have the same change in enthalpy. So it's usually a state function, meaning it's not going to change depending on which way we get there, as long as we have gotten to the answer. Another vocabulary word, or pretty much the last vocabulary word for this unit, is entropy. And if you've seen the beaker video I posted on, the, on this unit before, uh, at, immediately after you took the test, you saw that as things happened in the video, the video got more and more chaotic. And this is just a general law or general rule in life that as, as things happen, systems go from being very organized and neat to being very chaotic. Think of your bedroom. It starts very nice and neat, but as the week moves on, you've got cleats hanging from the ceiling, and you've got your, out, your uniform from your track practices all over the place. It, things degrade over time. Things go from being very organized to being extremely chaotic. Things move from order to chaos. That's entropy.